ICOC 3.0. I want to thank Valder and Doug for doing such an outstanding job yesterday. Under the section of your old men will dream dreams. That was great. I've never seen so many grandkids in a presentation in my life. But. And you know what that, you know what that elicited? Cell phones started coming out all over the place. Well, look at my grandkids, and we're gonna have a grandkid contest at some point. Have a vote. I just think that if we want to disunify ourselves, that's the, that's the way to do it. Just compare grandkids' strengths and weaknesses and all that good stuff. Uh, today is gonna be outstanding. Did the tribal meetings go well yesterday? Okay. I'm in the love tribe. What? Now that doesn't seem like a creative title, but it is the love tribe. We go by the love boat theme as our, uh, you know, so anyway, our tribe's fired up, so I hope we're all doing well. We're going to hear from the tribes later on today. If you could take out your schedule, we'll get started here in just a minute with a prayer, and then we're going to have a little bit of change in the schedule. Uh, uh, we're going to have Chris Zillman doing a devotional for us. But that devotion is going to be bumped to after uh, a few presentations. We're going to have the Disciples Today World Report by none other than Roger Lamb. Followed by Jeff Mantle and the ICOC app, the unveiling of the ICOC app here this morning. And then uh, a hot news presentation by Mike Tolliver will follow that. And then we'll head into our devotional. It's going to be a great day today. And we've got to stay really engaged, really encouraged. You know, we're going to, we're going to hear from Chris. I'll introduce him later. But he's going to give us the voice of the next generation generation. And so, you know, uh, we're going to hear that. It's, it, it's going to be outstanding. Uh, to get our hearts prepared for Roger Lamb to come on up, we're going to have Israel Ariola come up from Lagos, Nigeria. This is still under the theme of your old men will dream dreams. Because Israel kind of beats everybody with nine kids and 11 grandkids. And when I said, are there more to come? He's like, I'm just getting started with the grandkids. So let's have Israel come on up, lead us in a word of prayer, and we will get the day launched in a powerful way. Come on, Israel. Best dressed elder. <laughs> okay, let us pray. Our Father and our God, you're always there for us to approach. Because if we have to live with you eternally, we must relate with you here now. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to assemble from all over the world. Amen. And also to do a forward march by faith with you. Amen. We know once we walk with you, there is no value. We can only get victory in all aspects of what we do in your kingdom. And so we are here. You are the one who's going to talk to us. We are the one to listen. Give us a heart that accepts your word. Amen. And everything we will decide or think about here will be ordained from your throne. And all of us together will mutually obey you. Please pave the way forward. We will follow you. We will not avert anywhere till we reach our goal. Thank you so much for all that you have planned for us to have. Please be with us in everything we do here and hereafter. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Come on, Roger. Come on, Roger. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody awake, alert, and alive, and enthusiastic? And, all right. Uh, you uh, young men are having visions. Please keep up with these old men dreaming dreams. Come on, let's go. Uh, are you moving forward by faith? Yes? Um, <laughs> are we moving forward by faith? <laughs> oh, good. More than three people. That's great. Awesome. Excellent. That's encouraging. This uh, verse has been on my heart a whole lot more lately uh, for several reasons, but therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and sin that easy, so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes in Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Of course, that's after that cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 11. And then all the saints since then that have gone on, and we've had a bunch of people among us. They're in that 
crowd, cloud of witnesses who are cheering for us right now. You think of the Gerganuses, you know, and uh, Kevin Maines, and uh, all, all the people in between. I think we got to remember those folks. I started keeping a list because I, I started forgetting how many of those people there are. And we're all going to be in that cloud one of these days, Amen. prayerfully, right? Yeah. So let's remember they're cheering for us, and let's remember to fix our eyes on Jesus. Amen. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. Right. And uh, as long as we do that, I mean, he'll pioneer. He already pioneered. He's perfecting our faith as we move forward. Uh, we are the International Church of Christ, Churches of Christ, right? I love these college chants. We are the International Churches of Christ. Yeah. We are the International Churches of Christ. But we are international, right? Amen. I want to share with you very quickly uh, some great work that's going on among all of our, our people in these different areas. We have 10 service teams that are focused on different areas of ministry, and we're trying to get them more and more global around the world. And I just, I'm just teasing you so you can go get more information. We have a chairman service team that uh, is the chairman of each one of those service teams so we can coordinate them. And we initiated the ICOC 3.0 reevaluation surveys two years ago and then this year again. And uh, our, our goal is collaboration, cooperation among those service teams. It's so exciting to me to see every one of these service teams doing meaningful work. And these are silent servants who are not being paid to do that either. And they're, they're functioning all through the year, doing amazing things. Please be praying for them and reading about them and, right. and their reports. The evangelists, they put together this global missions report that's phenomenal. If you haven't read it, if you haven't got that to your people, you're missing out. And your people are missing some inspiration, on, especially your leaders. You need to get that to them. It's available on the leaders' or website. You can download it. You can pass it out to people. Uh, you can just give them the links. Our elders, there's a group of elders of the Western Conference of Seattle. Just happened. They like to have fun. There's a group of Northeastern elders also, but they're rather somber at the moment. Uh, there's other elders things going on. Here's elders being appointed around the world just in the last year. In uh, Munich, Kiev, Lagos, they now have four. In, uh, New York, Charleston, Boston, etc. Uh, please, if you haven't read this letter from Wyndham, please read this and pass it around. It's very touching. It explains his situation. And keep praying for him, please. The teachers, they're putting out some incredible material on this website. They have a, a, a column on Disciples Today. They're just really trying to feed our people. Didn't they do a phenomenal job preparing those videos for us to come here? Thank you very much. Awesome. The women... Today, column on Disciples Day is the most read besides the church locator. And uh, Jeannie and the sisters are doing an awesome job. They initiated this whole Be Bold Day, prayer and fasting. It's phenomenal stuff. The uh, campus is doing a phenomenal job. They've been studying the growth in our campuses. They've got a three-year history now of what's going on there. And they, they keep track of our campus locator. And so that families can find out where we have ministries, et cetera. And uh, that's there on the top of Disciples Today. There's a, a link for it. This one-year challenge thing has really been phenomenal. I just want to highlight one, one case in China. As a church of 250 has been built mostly through the one-year challenge. And a bunch of those people stayed and have been there many years and even married there, right? <laughs> and uh, they're there. But uh, they've had a ton of these one-year challenge people. Our one-year challenge site was built and is maintained in China, mainland China. That's, that's the house of it, and it's just a phenomenal thing. We're trying to get this into more regional families, so it's not just giving people away. It's, it's a sharing of folks together. Um, the singles are doing phenomenal work. Uh, the Grossets are now leading this, this family. If you don't know them from Phoenix, they're doing phenomenal. The cooks set it up, got it organized. The Grossets are taking over. They're doing incredible stuff uh, that you need to read about. This Youth and Family Conference Amen. coming up in Denver, 
Over 800 are registered already, and it's not till September. They've done a phenomenal job. Let's get our people there, especially our, our uh, uh, children's ministry people, as well as our teens and preteen leaders. Uh, this is a cool thing. Hope's going to give you more information tomorrow, but this is generational, and this is one of our teams. Um, this, this guy, this brother here, went on Hope Youth Corps as a teen, and now he's sending his teenager. This is awesome. We need, we're going to see more and more and more of that. Now we have an administration service team. So we have no excuses for not being organized anymore. We're so grateful to Tom Briscoe for serving as chairman of that. And there's the group. A bunch of them are here, and, and they're just going to keep us all running up from running off the rails. Then we have another team, the communication team. These are our good news sharks, the communications team. Yes, you had to, right? You just got to do that. And I'm going to submit that one as the cutest one. And anyway, all right. Amen. So disciples today, you know about, please keep telling your people this. Our people, they're getting so caught up in all this worldly stuff and worldly news and getting depressed and getting upset. Are we feeding them the good news to counteract the fake news and the bad news? I want to encourage you to use Disciples Today and ICOC Hot News, our, our partners, to get our people better news, the good news, to counteract and to get them focused on the good stuff. Amen. We have tons of Facebook pages that are engaging people more and more all the time. I just talked to the brothers from Russia yesterday. Their Facebook page for the, their Disciples Today version has 27,000 likes. And they were teaching me how to get that. Yeah, exactly. They figured it out. It's, they, it's not by hacking. They were doing other stuff. They're doing real stuff, right? And, uh, but they've learned some things, and they are focused on it. And they are really telling a lot of good stories. Um, I've been asking people as I speak, how many of you have seen or know about the cross video? And how many in here know about it? I've asked in our region, the oldest region of uh, uh, Boston, hardly anybody's seen the video. What? I asked here in Dallas the other day, hardly anybody's seen the video. This is an amazing thing Hollywood produced on the cross, our message. And uh, we need to use it cross studies. We need to use it around Easter. It's an amazing tool. That's, that's all I'm interested in. Let's, let's use that more. Um, we have this icocleaders.org site we've created so you'll know what's going on. You want to know what's going on with any of these service teams. You want to know how we're organized, the missions, etc. Just please go there. Uh, we've got all the proposals listed there, etc. We've got all the service team members listed there, etc. What are the challenges for our service teams? More international participation relationships. We're all talking about, we are facing a, another generation of how we're going to build the ligaments. And I think these service teams are a great way to start doing that in different levels. Uh, what will best accomplish God's mission? We're asking every service team to discuss how will their service team grow God's church. Uh, what kind of church we leave to our grandchildren? Every service team is focusing on that also and trying to figure out what to do about that. Now, let me just give you a faith story. You like faith stories in a faith conference? Well, Jesus talked about our mustard seed, right? Uh, we've been praying for a while to be able to have an app for the church and to be able to be more effective and keep using these tools. Well, you know the story. God brought us Jonathan Hogard, PhD in digital media. We were able to bring him on in 2013 to help with the hope stuff. Well, with, with, along with that, he started building a relationship with a, a group called MGive to give hope, this text to give thing and, and so on. And, uh, you'll hear more about that in a minute. But he, a guy came in and bought MGive and now he wants to use his online marketing thing to build this massive cutting edge uh, tool for faith-based ministries. And, uh, and so he wants to use the church and hope as his beta to get into this area because he loves our mission and he loves what we do and he loves our focus on serving people. 
Uh, and Jonathan's built this relationship with two years with him. He came to Jonathan. He said, I want to invest in this. I want to put money behind it. And uh, so we got excited about that, obviously, and said, well, we're going to need somebody to market that. And then as God would have it, there's this, this guy on the, the left there, Jeff Mantle, when he was uh, a kid and, uh, in a Harry's Chapel in Charleston. I started bringing him to church when he was in third grade on a little church bus. And uh, that was what his preacher looked like at, at that time. He had dark hair. Um, now this is at Reach with, with John and Jeff and Michael and myself. And it's just so awesome to see what God has done with them, right? So Jeff hears about this. He says, I want to do that. Well, he had just come off the, the REACH Summit and doing a phenomenal job with that. And that, that app was a cutting-edge, life-changing thing, right, for us. And uh, so we, we said, awesome. And then he found a donor. He'll tell you about it here in a minute. But uh, so we were able to bring Jeff on to help us market this out. And I think God just set up the perfect team here. And Jeff's going to tell us all about this app and how it's going to help you build your church where you're at. Amen? Amen. Jeff? Way to go, Rod. First of all, I want to uh, thank you for the opportunity that I got to, to lead Reach, uh, Direct Reach. It was an honor of a lifetime and it was a joy. It will be, um, it'll be one of those things that obviously I remember for the rest of my life, but just thank you for the opportunity to do that and have, have you in St. Louis. It was a great joy. One of the things that happened at Reach is I had a, uh, I have a friend that I had studied the Bible with, became a Christian who's uh, very young, 32 years old, and had just sold a billion dollar tech company I thought, this guy needs a mentor. This guy needs people in his life that are disciples that understand. And I had a kind of a dreaming, brainstorming discipleship group in, in my room at Reach and had Valdur in there. And for this young guy to look at Valdur, who'd been there and done that, and a man of great faith that has devoted his life to the church was kind of a life-changing moment for him. Nice. And, and so when, when this happened soon after Reach, I was driving down the highway, get a call from, from Jonathan, hey, we're looking for somebody to do this. I'm like, I'm in. And he said, we also need some funding. I'm like, well. So I sat down, and this brother um, who poked holes in this thing. You don't build a billion dollar company without knowing what you're doing. Uh, he poked holes in it and we came up with this app idea and uh, after round, 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 he's, we're, we're like, we're in. And he said, I'm in, I wanna invest. He invested almost a quarter million dollars of his own money because he's passionate about using tech to connect people. And he wants to see the church do amazing things. And he, along with Frank, who uh, is with uh, Rally that Roger was talking about, um, sorry, gosh, I started wrong. Um, Frank, tell you what, he looked at our fellowship. He'd read everything there is to read on the fellowship. He read all the garbage on the fellowship. He said, okay, that's in the past. It doesn't matter. That's in the past. You have so many amazing stories in your churches, and they're not being told well. You've got Disciples Today, you've got ICOC Hot News, but these stories aren't getting out there. We need to develop an app. We need to get, a, get these stories into the hands of your members. Oh, he loves Roger. What is this on my screen? Um, let, me, let me close this out. Uh, here are the, some of the companies that Rally4 works with. Uh, they, when the Haiti earthquake hit and MGive raised millions of dollars in one day for Haiti, they became the gold standard in text to give. And uh, these are some of the companies they work with. This is the team that we're working with to build the app. It's uh, quite an amazing team. The whole goal of the app is that we stay connected. Information is very important. And I want to say in the outset, there are quite a few churches that have apps and, and people are developing apps and I'm not here to step on anybody's toes. Anything that we do to kind of be forward thinking and, and change uh, is important. The one thing that we are able to do uh, with almost about $500,000 worth of development money that has gone into just this app, um, with, with all the people that have uh, put money in, is that we're creating an enterprise app that does not exist anywhere on the globe right now. 
Right now, apps are like, we've got a local app and it's just us. It's great information for just us, but it doesn't connect to a sister church and their communication. What we're building is something where everything is connected. We will be able to share stories, hope information. Disciples today will be able to share information down to everybody that has an app in their hand at one time. And we'll also be able to collect information up. It's going to be a connector for all of us. Uh, we need to stay connected. Uh, we want to connect our, our members. This, when you open up the app for your church, it is a local app. When, you, when your members look at it, it's going to have your logo on it, your colors, your content, your information. Again, this is not an ICOC or Disciples Today app, I'm sorry, or a Hope app or this or that. We're going to get that information down to everybody, but this is your local app. The difference is there'll be a button on there with disciplestoday.tv and you're going to get great video content from the best from a lot of you here in this room. You're going to get hope information about what's going on all over the world so that you can stay connected. And one of the things that we want to do, uh, the guys at the, the rally office, they're incredible writers. And they came up with this idea, let's get interns in all the churches and uh, let's work, they said, here, let's work with your teenagers and your millennials because they understand the internet. Let's get them working with the empty nesters in your church that are looking for something to do to build the church. Let's use the wisdom of the mature and the knowledge of the young to write stories. So we're not, so the stories we're getting are not always just the mind blowing. It is here, um, look at this story of, that happened with this kid in this middle school ministry in Boise, Idaho. That's just like the kid in your middle school ministry in your church, sharing stories back and forth one to another. Um, again, it's, it's, uh, this is a clean, beautiful, if the app is not clean and beautiful, members won't use it. And if members won't use it, then we won't, there's no use in having it. This is going to be a, a beautiful uh, app for our churches. Um, it's going to help us uh, with donations. Donations are going to be super easy. It'll be very easy to set up, let's say, here's something to, to collect money for a couple that's ha want, wanting to adopt and needs help. Or here's a, a conference that's coming up. We're going to have registration built into the app. A lot of us are using Eventbrite and others, and you're paying extra money to use Eventbrite and all those. Other. There will be no extra upcharge to create events in your app. You go through, you fill out the form, you hit pay, boom, one time, you're done. It doesn't take you out of the app. Registration, uh, you're not going to find that uh, on other apps. Uh, look at that look guy that. preaching the word. Yeah. So um, obviously you're going to have great video content. But again, if your local church does not put up video content of your sermons, you will still have access to dtoday.tv to get video uh, content. When you use this as an evangelistic tool, let me tell you, we have in St. Louis about 340 members. We've had an app for a couple of years. Uh, we use it instead of passing out a card. We use it just download our app. 1,350 people have downloaded our app. They're watching the content. They're looking at what's happening at church long before they ever walk through the door of your church. So they know who you are. Um, we, uh, we're going to create in the future, roll, rolling this out, we're doing this with a few churches, but uh, moving the websites over so that the, the app and the website, everything is updated all at once, immediate. I want you to imagine there is a, there is a, a disaster and Robert needs to get this message out now. Before it was, hey, could you please make an announcement this Sunday? We need to get this done. There's a disaster over here. Now we'll be able to send out a message to the whole globe or regionally and say, we need this now. You go in there, you hit a button, donate. The money is in their account like days later instead of weeks later after the disaster uh, when they needed the money. It's very important for us to be able to do that. If there is a local disaster in your area, there's a hurricane, and a hurricane or a tsunami or a tornado has gone through, then we can send out a designated, okay, if you live in this 100-mile radius, we need the people, the team at your church, the local church is ready to go, to go. Right? So there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be able to do. Analytics, very important. We're able to pull stuff up so that you can uh, get the information and get it out. I got I to gotta go. Look at my next slide. Is thank you. And Mike is over here eager to get up here. You're Mike, no, no, no. You're awesome. <laughs> you're awesome. But here's what I want you to do. Uh, I'm here all week. And I have, if you text the word meet, 
to 80077. Just text the word meet to 80077. It'll pull up a calendar for me. Any half hour slot that's open, you can take it. It's yours. Let's meet in the lobby. We'll sit down and, uh, and talk about what, how we can help you. All right, amen. Thank you, guys. Here we go. Yeah, these guys, as they set up, I'll, uh, they're going to they're gonna set up. And uh, Zach, you have someone to dim the lights in just a moment? You, okay, great. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity just to share for a moment about ICOC Hot News. And we really appreciate the continued and growing support. And uh, we're just finding more and more support coming back from you guys. And we really appreciate that. Um, I want to encourage you to show them, but also to encourage others to show them. Uh, those in your churches, uh, show them, please. And uh, coming up this year, it's, it's awesome. Kiev, Berlin, Paris, Brazil, Bolivia, Africa. And that's just the first half of the year, Lord willing. So tremendous stuff is in the pipeline. It's been fun working with the various mission societies who have learned that, hey, if we show professional quality videos here, our, our special goes up and it, our people are informed and fired up. We're also partnered up with Hope Worldwide, so you're going to be seeing uh, a, uh, an ICC Hot News produced video promoting and educating us about Hope Worldwide, one per month, and uh, actually one's going to come out uh, today. And we're eager to, and we've begun working with the service teams. So that's very exciting. We feel that we can really do a lot to communicate what your service team is doing and uh, help and uh, in, in, in a variety of ways. So, but this today is, uh, is a big day for us. These, uh, uh, Zach Fazio has a master's degree in documentary filmmaking. Uh, Nathan has a, a film degree from the University of Texas and was actually out working uh, in Hollywood when he came back to, to take our organization higher. And today what we're introducing is our first full length, 90 minute feature ever produced in the ICOC. Tremendous stuff has been produced. This is the first time we've gone 90 minutes. Uh, it's called Finding Guy. And tonight will be the premiere. It's a, you know, it's a closed premiere for our group, uh, especially. It's booked to show this summer at the largest denominational purity conference that's held in the U.S. They have booked to show this film coming up in July. We're excited about the potential to encourage people and to touch uh, this part of our population. I'm going to turn it over to the producer, Nathan, and then the director, Zach, will speak after the f we show a short clip. Well, it's very encouraging to see all of you here today. As my dad said, I'm Nathan Tolliver. I am the director editor at ICOC Hot News. But today I'm here as the producer of Finding Guy. Finding Guy is our first 90-minute documentary film about the life and ministry of Guy Hammond, and we're going to be showing you a clip from the film in just a couple seconds here. Now, we've produced some dynamic content in the last couple of years. We released a short film, Now or Never, and Vanishing, both of which won awards. Um, but this is by far, I believe, the biggest thing that we have ever done at ICOC Hot News. We've never done anything on this scale. So with that, I want to show you a clip from the film, after which Zach Fazio, the director, is going to make a couple comments. Good morning. If you have a Bible, you can open up to Numbers chapter 14. There's a moment in the Bible where God's wrath is raised by the complaining of the Israelites. And within their grumbling lies a statement that seems to particularly offend God's sensibilities. It takes place right after the 10 spies delivered an unfavorable report about the difficulty in taking the promised land that God gave them. Uh -huh. And in Numbers 14, verse 1, it says, That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly and said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. <laughs> Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taking us plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And the Israelites were genuinely afraid. They believed that their own families would suffer by going where God wanted them to go. The spirit of their grumbling revealed that they did not believe God would take care of those wives and those children in the wilderness. God's response to them in verse 26 is this, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? 
I've heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do the very thing that I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who has counted in the census and who has grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter the promised land. I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb and Joshua. As, as for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them into the, in to enjoy the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. Until the last days, your bodies lie in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked communi community, which is banded together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness, and here they will die. This scene, after the negativity and cynicism of the spies, has already spread through the mass of the people, and now those people are realizing the price that they will have to pay for their cynicism is crushing their unwillingness to trust the faithful voices, their failure of nerve, and finally, the looking backwards to their slavery in Egypt with longing. God punished them with 40 years in the desert until the unfaithful generation had died and was gone. Their children would grow up in the wilderness and learn hardship caused by their parents' unfaithfulness. This is a poignant moment in the biblical narrative. This scene haunts me as we consider our current course for our fellowship's future. I was baptized in 1995 at the age of 19. I did not grow up in the church. I came to know God's kingdom as a brute come out of the wilderness into honest society. A month after I was baptized, I was offered a ministry position that I turned down because I was chasing my girlfriend on the other side of the country to her school. <laughs> Yet over the next two years, I applied for six or seven mission teams to Europe and was rejected for each one of them. <laughs> 40 years, 40 years in the wilderness. <laughs> I remember when the guy that I studied the Bible with and baptized, and who had been a Christian for less than two years, was asked to go lead the mission team to Skopje, Macedonia upon his graduation. And I remember how thrilled I was for him and yet how desperate I was for my own chance. I went into the full-time ministry two weeks before I graduated college. Somehow, Randy McKean found the money to put me on staff. There you go, Randy. Our first year in the ministry, my wife and I made $19,000 of combined income, where our rent was about 8,000 of that, and our student loans were another 4,000 of that. And we could not have been more content and more happy with our lots. Like most people, we moved a lot, though not so much as many of you. We had eight homes in our first 10 years of marriage. I have loved every moment of being in this church. The most challenging times have made for my best stories and my greatest times of personal and spiritual growth. But the good times have heavily outweighed the bad times. I proudly call myself a kingdom guy. And I shamelessly believe that this church full of God's people is the best place to find Jesus and walk with him for the rest of your lives. We may not be the only church, but it is certainly the only church for me. Yet alas, I am no longer young and have not been so for over a decade. <laughs> in church football games, I am asked more and more to stay back and block rather than go out for a pass. At least you're still playing, man. That's, that's the sign still playing, my own children can crush me in a 5K. It takes me twice as long to learn a video game as it does someone half my age. And amongst the campus ministers, I begin to feel the deference that is reserved for age rather than the respect that is shown for accomplishment. Say that again. So you cannot trust my voice to innately know the heart of youth anymore. However, I am consistently surrounded with the thoughts and the desires of the younger generations. 
Those of my age, the white whales between 35 and 45, who largely disappeared after 2003, those who are 30 and those who are 20, and between those decades lies an ocean of difference in worldview. There are the kingdom kids whose parents are embittered and shared those bitterness, who have one worldview. And there are the kingdom kids whose parents would never say anything negative in front of their own children, who have another worldview. And you have Gentile conversions, Gentile conversions that have their own views. And this room today gathers a great percentage of the influence and authority within our present movement. What is it the younger generations would wish you to remember? Well, here are a few things I think they'd want you to know. First of all, under no circumstances should the older generations wear skinny jeans. Let's just get real quick. Dude, dude, you are killing me. They, uh, they want us to be less exclusive with whom we term disciple. Amen. And at the same time, they want us to be clear about who is and who is not a disciple. Amen. They want the romance of mission work, but sometimes without the work part. <laughs> they want to change the world still, Amen. but they'd love to do that with health benefits and retirement. That's right. <laughs> That's right. They want us to be modern and technologically relevant. And they want us also to be primitive and grassroots and organic. They want us to have passionate preaching. And they want us to have conversational teaching. And they honestly would just love to have more wine and cheese parties. <laughs> and they still want to do medical brigades in remote parts of the world. The voice of the next generation, like all generations, is a paradox. I don't think there is accounting or planning for all of them. And anyone that would make a definitive statement about what the next generation needs or wants is courting delusion. For any statement that is applied to the next generation would most likely find its rebuttal in near equal numbers from that same cohort. But if we were to narrow the voices of those that are currently leading and who have opted for a lifetime of service in the ministry, paid or unpaid, then things become a little less muddy and perhaps a little more consistent in view. And I have to be clear here, there are many on the sidelines with loud and persistent views who rarely share their faith, who rarely study the Bible with disciples, and who are generally more concerned with their own personal growth than with the work of spreading the gospel. And I do not include their views here as they do not fall into the group of people carrying on the work begun by those in this room. I would not ignore their criticisms, nor would I say that they're without merit. But I would first understand and give my service to those whose dreams and whose views were rendered in the context of personal sacrifice, of ministry service, and of a ready humility to carry on the work begun by those here. Right. What do I think the nearly 200 full-time campus ministers that I know would want you to know? That First of all, they don't care what the structure looks like, as long as it gets the work done without having to have a lot of meetings about talking about getting the work done. <laughs> they don't think that all your fears are warranted. They would like the privilege to question things about our fellowship that are non-negotiably biblical and what things might be more constructs of our era and culture. They do not feel entitled to have a voice in this crowd or in these meetings because they genuinely do not believe that they've earned it yet. They don't want you to step aside merely on account of age. They just don't want their own age to automatically disqualify themselves from greater service. They don't simply want a job. They want you to walk with them and to train them consistently and to help them become something more than they presently are. For surely they are not plug and play. They are raw and they don't need to be pulled as to what they want. They need to be shaped into what our people need. And to put an exclamation point on something mentioned yesterday, 
They want their own stories of sacrifice and risk and courage, like you earned when we were a less cautious and more ambitious movement. They want you to stop ensuring that they don't have scars of their own as they long to trade tales of their own battles fought and won and lost. I don't know how we find our way back to that place unilaterally. But I know that the lore of past deeds done, while initially inspiring, becomes a dagger to the hearts of those who start to feel such days are gone by and the way barred to relive them again. You know, there's a guy who leads our youth and family ministry in the region I oversee, and he made a comment the other day that he, he didn't mean it negatively. He related the first time he went to a staff meeting a few years ago and was told that all the young staff members better be ready to be sent overseas or out on a local mission, that they better prepare their hearts to be sent. And how exciting and scary that was for him and how that week him and his wife prayed and surrendered themselves and, and got to the point where they were ready to be sent and every week they would go to staff meeting ready to be tapped on the shoulder and surrendered <laughs> that they would be going somewhere. And he realized now, after a few years, he's come to the understanding that that sort of thing doesn't really happen very much anymore. And it's really just more of a mentality that the older generation wants the younger generation to have. When he told me this, I didn't bother trying to explain to him the fact that we weren't growing enough for there to be opportunities for him to be sent out. It isn't that we don't want to send out younger people, we just don't have the resources for it. Honestly, that distinction to him would be meaningless. And there's the young woman who is in the full-time ministry in the region of our campus, <clears throat> and she grew up in the church her entire life. And I had been explaining the evolution of how our fellowship is, is organized and, uh, and currently why we do things the way we do in the ICOC right now. And she'd not heard of world sector leaders. You know, she, she'd not known what those were. And I had to explain a lot of things because she was only eight years old in 2003. And when we explained the necessary changes in our, organization, in our organization, she asked a pretty telling question. And without any disrespect to the living, I'll tell you in all seriousness, she asked, so when did Kip McKean die? Oh, wow. This is how unaffected and removed our youngest leaders are from the past. <laughs> and a past that they see still haunts the older generation so powerfully. Man. I am reminded by sitting in these tribes yesterday how complicated the concept of cooperation can become. The simple yes or no questions that were posed were fraught with theological, emotional, <laughs> spiritual, and relational implications that made it nearly impossible to decipher the intent of what was usually, which was a, a usually well-written and grammatically correct English question. <laughs> I, I wondered what our children would think of us in our discussions. I think that they would be amazed by the intelligence and the insight. I think they would find security in the show of mutual respect even as people stood on different sides of organizational philosophy. I think they would be embarrassed by how much Bible they still don't know by how deftly it was integrated into the discussions. But would they hear within my own offered thoughts and opinions, and within yours, that spirit of Caleb that silenced the unfaithful spies and said, we can do this thing. What spirit do you offer to God as we consider the course before us? In verse 24 of Numbers 14, it says, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. I don't know what ICOC 3.0 looks like, and I'll tell you right here, now the younger generation doesn't care. <laughs> wow. Just as long as those in this room adopt it wholeheartedly, yeah. foolheartedly, right. assured that they can risk, that this generation will risk everything because God is going with them. Amen. I am not young anymore. <laughs> 20 years ago, I shared a bedroom with Kevin Miller in the apartment in which we were living. And we would stay up almost every night late into the night dreaming about what we would do in the kingdom of God, where we, where we would go, what countries we would lead, and the sermons that we would give one day. It was, exha <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> it was exhausting. <laughs> and as I would fall asleep, inevitably Kevin would whisper to me, Chris, 
Chris. Chris, Kevin, go to sleep. No, Chris. What? Whose side are you fighting on? <laughs> Kevin, I'm not doing this. <laughs> Chris, whose side are you fighting on? I'm fighting on the Lord's side. <laughs> hey, Chris. Chris, shut up, Kevin! No, no, seriously, whose side are you fighting on? I'm fighting on the Lord's side. And then he would jump out of bed and jump onto mine and just scream at the top of his lungs, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting, I'm fighting on the Lord's side! <laughs> Whatever our plans, we should make sure that the younger generation still exist in a fellowship where sleep eludes them for the excitement, the risk, and the danger that awaits those still willing to fight for the promised land. Amen. Thank you very much.